Good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to congratulate the Kerala State ISA for conducting this conference under these difficult situations. And also thank you for giving me this opportunity to be a faculty on your conference panel. I'll start by sharing my screen. How many of us actually monitor for post-operative cognitive functions in the perioperative period? I'm sure not many of us, unless it is a part of some thesis or a project. Let's look at a patient in the PSC clinic. A 60 year old man walks into the clinic and says, my brother who is 65 years had a fracture in his leg after, and after surgery, my brother had erratic behavior. Will I also have it? He has some problem remembering names and doing some tasks since he returned home after surgery. Is it because of some continuing effects of anesthesia? And how long will that last? Will I also lose my memory after surgery? Now, what he's talking about is post-operative delirium and cognitive fund dysfunction. Now, for long we've thought that anesthetic effects are, are completely reversible, but now we understand that these anesthetics can have some lasting effects. So to understand or to answer these questions, let's look at what POCD means and what is post-operative cognitive dysfunction, what is its relation to anesthesia, how do we assess the risk and manage these patients. It's important for the anesthetist to understand about post-operative cognitive dysfunction because there have been links of POCD with anesthesia and surgery. And in order to counsel the patients appropriately and also to adopt techniques to minimize the POCD, we need to understand how it's caused and what causes it. What is cognitive dysfunction? It's a problem with the thinking and perception. It is deterioration in the intellectual functions presenting as impaired memory or function. So we have a spectrum of cognitive dysfunctions that is from delirium to minimal impairment of cognition to dementia. Postoperative delirium is easy to identify and there are a lot of screening tests for it. But the problem is, is there a link between delirium and long-term cognitive impairment in dementia? Now, some studies have identified that there are certain risk factors for post-operative cognitive dysfunction, like increasing age, fewer years of education, depression, previous stroke, lacuna, sedative drugs, time spent with a bispectral index less than 40, post-operative delirium, post-operative infection and pulmonary complications. And so post-operative delirium is one of the risk factors for post-operative cognitive dysfunction. And also there are several common risk factors between delirium and dysfunction. So it is possible that those patients who had delirium in the post-operative period would also have a post-operative cognitive dysfunction. Now, is this likely to progress? Maybe. Not many studies support it, but there are some that say that those who had a POCD are likely to have an increased risk for dementia in the post-operative period. If you look at the incidence of post-operative cognitive dysfunction in cardiac surgeries, it is highest. In vascular surgery, it's reported between 5 and 40. In non-cardiac surgeries, the incidence is around 11 to 20 percent. Now, there's a wide variation in the incidence of the cognitive dysfunction in the post-operative period that is reported. Now, why is the reason for that? One is that the incidence varies with the type of population that we are sampling and also the type of diagnosis that is made. Does the type of surgery change the incidence of POCD? Yes. Major thoracic, intra-abdominal and orthopedic procedures are at an increased risk for POCD. Now, the other cause for incidence is a lack of awareness or monitoring for the POCD. What is it that causes this? First is the definition. The definition is a very gray area. Now, minimal cognitive impairment is defined as impairment in the cognition, which key has the functional independence preserved. Whereas major cognitive disorder is cognitive change where there is an interference with the daily independence activities. Now, these most of these definitions are not really black and white. There are a lot of gray areas. So there is a barrier for identifying post-operative cognitive dysfunction. And also, the problem is that it requires multimodal testing for identifying POCD and confirming the diagnosis. 
Several tests have been described for identifying uh, POCD, but there's no consensus on which test is the best. In the general psychiatric clinic or the geriatric clinic, an abbreviated mental test or mini mental state examination is commonly done, but then these fail to identify the subtle changes that occur in the post-operative period. So in the perioperative period, Montreal Cognitive Assessment Tool or Edinburgh Cognitive Exam or Quick MCI Screen can be helpful. Now, these are the various screens that are available. And some of them have even been adapted for the Indian scenarios. So the comparison of these uh, tests show that most of them have good sensitivity and specificity, and they can be easily downloaded online if you want to use them. But there are several confounding factors for these tests. For example, pain can interfere with the testing. So the optimal time for testing it in the perioperative period is when the patient is minimally affected by anxiety and pain or acute medications. And the problem is that it takes a long time and we need to have some dedicated clinics to do the testing. Post-operatively, again, there's a lot of interference or confounding factors for the testing. Ideally, it should be done at one week and also three months of the procedure. So a decline in the Z scores using one of the tests is how we identify that there's a cognitive decline. And when this happens, we need to look at the scores with the background of the age, gender, and education. And if it is severe, we should consult the geriatrician or a neuropsychiatrist. Most of the time, this is self-limited. But, and long-term follow-up has shown that there is a significant improvement with time. By two years, less than 10% had a continuity of this POCD. One of the large studies, the Optima study, has shown that uh, the cognitive dysfunction is greater in those patients who had a pre-existing cognitive decline as opposed to those who have had a normal cognitive decline. So, Identifying these patients preoperatively can help us. When we consider that anesthesia is going to influence the POCD, we need to know how it is going to do that. A lot of translational research is focused on the interaction between anesthetic agents and this long-lasting effect on the cognition. A lot of what we know today is interpolated from the Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, there are interneuronal neurofibrillary uh, tangles which undergo aberrations and also neuro neurochemical changes that happen and it is possible that the anesthetics influence the cognition by changing these neurofibrillary tangles and causing amyloid breaks. Studies have shown that volatile agents can affect this Alzheimer's process and intravenous anesthetics can in fact have a beneficial effect by inhibiting these Alzheimer's processes. It is another theory that has been perpetrated is the role of neuroinflammation in cerebral microemboli. And this may be the reason why it is commoner in those patients who have had a cardiac surgery. Microemboli can happen during cardiopulmonary bypass and can lead to multiple cerebral infarctions leading to postoperative cognitive dysfunction. There are several modifiable factors during anesthesia that can help in reducing the post-operative cognitive dysfunction like hypotension, hypoxia, and altered cerebral perfusion. One of the last study on POCD has more than about 1,200 patients had failed to show an association between any of these factors and POCD. However, some studies on cardiac surgery have shown that cerebral hypoxia could be contributing to changes in the cognition. Similarly, does the choice of anesthesia matter? This is again a contentious issue because some studies have supported Propofol whereas some studies have supported zero-fluorine. And there are some last studies that have said that the choice of the anesthetist doesn't matter, but it is the depth of anesthesia that can be responsible. And a depth less than 20 was associated with a higher instant relief. But again, another study has shown that light anesthesia had a higher probability of having cognitive decline in the four to six weeks after surgery. Does regional anesthesia by avoiding these drugs confer any protection? Some studies have shown that there's no difference in the incidence of delirium or a PVOCD in those patients who have undergone regional anesthesia or general anesthesia. Now, whenever we talk about anesthesia, there's always an underlying surgery. So how do we, and we know that 
the neurocognitive dysfunction is related to the neurochemical changes and which can be caused by stress of surgery as well. How do we separate the effect of surgery from the anesthesia? And this can be done only in translational studies. However, the results of translational studies are not consistent. Some have shown that anesthetics, especially volatile agents, can have an effect on the long-term memory, whereas some did not show an effect. Now, if we, is there a prophylaxis or a therapy against PUCD? Dexmatomidine is one of the promising candidates, and studies have shown that it can offer some anti-delirium neuroprotection. But not all studies support these results. There are some studies that have shown that there's no significant reduction in the delirium or cognitive dysfunction at three to six months, even in those patients where dexmatomidine was used. Some people have even tried remote ischemic preconditioning in cardiac surgery and also antioxidants like anesthetic to see if the incidence of postoperative cognitive dysfunction can be reduced. So for now, we do not have any treatment for postoperative cognitive dysfunction. So we need to look at how we can actually prevent it or reduce the incidence. First step starts in the preoperative period with chronic disease management. So try to reduce the risks of uh, like hypertension, obesity, and diabetes management. And also, uh, if there can be some uh, activities that can lower the cognitive dysfunction in the preoperative period, they can be helpful in the postoperative period. Alcohol is strongly related to delirium and long-term cognitive dysfunction, and abstinence from alcohol can help. Similarly, benzodiazepines can increase the risk of delirium and hence should be avoided. In the pre-anesthetic evaluation, it should be important for us to document any visual and hearing impairments so that these don't contribute to further cognitive dysfunction in the post-operative period. And also general improvement in the general health can help, like improving the magnesium levels can reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's. Now there's a paradigm shift in the fasting guidelines and reduction in the fasting times for clear fluids can also reduce the risk of POCD and LA. It is very common to have polypharmacy in the preoperative period. And it has been shown that association between benzodiazepines and reduced incidence of uh, cognitive dysfunction, hence this should be avoided. And also, if the patient is on chronic psychoactive medications like anti it should be important to continue these things. Most important thing is discussion with the patient. Now we have found a patient who was willing to discuss these things. So what are these answers that we have for this patient? So will I also have it? Can anesthesia cause delirium? Well, yes. Is there a genetic predisposition? Yes. Is it because of continuing effects of anesthesia? Maybe. How long will that last? We still do not have an answer for that. And will I lose my memory too? Well, it depends on the risk assessment and the coexisting problems, the type of surgery the patient is likely to undergo, and also the intraoperative and postoperative complications. Can we do something to avoid it? That is what we need to look at. Now, intraoperative monitoring for the depth of anesthesia is important because both low and high BIS values have shown to be associated with POCD. However, the large ISBOCD study has failed to find any association between POCD, hypoxia, or even the cerebral oxygenation monitoring. There's no clear evidence to show that anesthetics uh, use can increase or reduce the probability of POCD, but there is some support to say that propofol can help in reducing the incidence. Again, there's no evidence that regional anesthesia can make things better, but pain management, definitely yes, can reduce the incidence of POCD. So to summarize, preoperative factors that enhance the postoperative cognitive dysfunction are age, existing cognitive dysfunction, pre-existing comorbidities, and low education level. And hospital-associated factors like environmental change, duration of hospital stay, and sleep disorders, what can help are minimally invasive surgeries, pain management, early discharge, and improvement in the sleep quality. And post-operative factors like inflammation, pain, sleep disorder, and opioids can aggravate it. So if you look at the 
management plan for post-operative patients who are at high risk for POCD. First is identify the risk. Age more than 65, existing cognitive dysfunction or a suspected cognitive impairment, previous history of stroke or poor functional status, patients undergoing major surgery with the expected time of more than 1.5 hours. And if there is a high risk for post-operative respiratory complications, these are the high risk patients. In these patients, it's important that we do a cognitive risk testing preoperatively so that we can identify post-operative cognitive decline and see if there is a need for a specialist assessment. And also review the pharmacy that the patient is using optimize the chronic diseases, and if they are on hearing or visual aids, continue with them. Alcohol abstinence, reduce fasting times, and prehabilitation for cognition can help. Similarly, correct anemia and electrolytes. So once the patient is optimized, there should be counseling for the possibility of post-operative cognitive dysfunction, and give the surgical options, that is minimal surgery with a lesser duration, take adequate consent, monitor the depth of anesthesia, provide adequate analgesia, maintain the blood pressure and oxygenation post-op, continue with pertinent medications, avoid any high-risk medications, and this will help a long way in prevention of the post-operative cognitive dysfunction. So to conclude, the decline in the cognitive function after surgical event and associated anesthesia is recognized as a problem in the elderly population, but lack of agreed definitions and identification is the barrier and we need to have these for appropriate assessment of these patients. The cause of POCD in the post-operative period is still debatable. The role of anesthetics is inconclusive, but minimizing POCD remains a perioperative priority. So consider reduction of its incidence by looking at all the plausible factors which can be modified. So improve perioperative pathways, are useful in reducing the risk of cognitive decline in the post-operative period. Thank you.